Ooh. Hi, it's Robin. This box just arrived in the mail. It's something I bought on eBay recently. I have never received a box quite like this with stamps all the way around, huge sheets. <laughs> on all four sides. So I looked them up. They're all from the Small Canadian Mammal Series, issued October 3rd, 1988. Yep, they are stamps from the 80s. Somehow the seller had full sheets of them, I guess. So let's have a little bit of stamp time here. This is the Varying Hair, 5 cent denomination. It's a 10 by 10 sheet, so that's 5 bucks Canadian. 7 by 10 of the hair, so another $3.50. The 6 cent denomination is the fox, and that's another 10 by 10, so that is $6. And finally here we have the skunk for the 10 cent denomination, a range 10 by 7, so that is $7. $21.50 postage. But that wasn't enough. When he went to mail it, they still asked for an extra dollar, which they put on just like the, the metered sticker on the top. <laughs> anyway, my dad's really into stamps. So, Dad, I hope you like that. So this box, I believe, is full of computer books. I had some of them, but it had two in particular that I really want. And it just worked out. This was, it was, they're hard to get. So I was happy for this opportunity. So hopefully they're in, in here and in good shape. Let's open it up. Those stamps aren't cancelled, so actually we could, I guess we could use them again. Okay. <laughs> what have we got here? Empty DVD cases for packing? This is also a first. Those might actually be useful. And lots of plastic bags. PC Optimum. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Okay, teach yourself computer programming with the Commodore 64. I do not have that one. That's not the main one I was looking for. Commodore 1541 Disk Drive User's Guide. I've already got that. More manuals. The VIC 1541 User's Manual. Another 1541 User's Guide. Oh, the 1526 Dot Matrix Printer User's Guide. I do not have that one. More 1541 manuals. Okay. I don't need <laughs> all these, but again, this was all uh one lot i probably already have the 801 dot matrix printer user's manual compiler design and implementation for c64 by a data becker book that's all wrapped up i'll cover up that guy's address the pet cbm personal computer guide well i think this was the first edition of this. Actually, I don't have this edition. I have the later one, which is an excellent book. Your Commodore 64 Guide to the Commodore 64 Computer. I actually like it when stickers are left on these. Originally $21.95, $11.99, and down to $4.99 at Kohl's Bookstore. I don't know if Kohl's is, other, is only Canadian, but they used to be a very big bookseller here. Mastering Sight and Sound on the, on the, on the, on the Commodore 64, discounted to $2.99 by Kent Porter. Okay, this is one of the two books that I really wanted from this collection. Computes VIC-20 and Commodore 64 Toolkit Kernel by Dan Hebe. So that's, we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail today. And okay, yep. Yeah. And here's the other book. This is the companion book, also by Dan Hebe, the Toolkit Basic. 
So we'll look at those more in a bit. Just uh, go through the rest of the box here. There's the VIC-20 Programmer's Reference Guide. That's an excellent book. Compute's first book of VIC. And of course, the Commerce 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. Bought at WH Smith for $27.95. By the way, I bought these from a fellow Canadian, so probably all these books were bought in Canada. And what's the final book here? Sam's Commerce 64 128 Assembly Language Programming. I do not have that one, I think, by Mark Andrews. That is a great haul of books. For I think it was around $100 in total, which nowadays is a steal, especially for those two books to be included, because they're, they're extremely difficult to find now. Okay, so I'm going to set up the overhead camera, and we're going to look at those toolkit books in more detail. Okay, here's the two books. Again, it's Computes, VIC-20, and Commodore 64 Toolkit. Basic, which I believe is the first book that was released, and then Kernel, interestingly, all in lowercase. So again, with these book club videos, my goal isn't to, you know, convey all the information in these books. That would be impossible to do in a video and kind of ridiculous. The main goal is to make you aware of the information that's available in all these various books I look at and then point you towards either trying to get a real copy yourself, which is very difficult for these books, unfortunately, but they are available online, good scans of them, and there'll be links in the description below as usual. So I thought I had all the great books for the Commerce 64, but I think it was David Yaud who made me aware of these two books. And as far as I can tell, these are amazing books and they belong right up there when I talk about the great books like Programming the Commodore 64 by Rachel Colin West, Mapping the C64 by Sheldon Lehman, and of course the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide itself. I think these books should be right up there in that upper echelon. So we'll look at the basic book first. On the back cover, Building with Basic. Your computer's basic ROM routines, those magic parts of BASIC that actually make it work, may seem like a mystery to you. If you've been programming for any length of time, you know how to use BASIC, but you probably don't know how it works inside the computer. That knowledge is powerful. Understanding how BASIC's routines actually operate can open up an entire new world of programming. VIC-20 and Commerce 64 Toolkit BASIC is a comprehensive guide to those basic ROM routines in the Commerce 64 and VIC-20 computers. Thoroughly documented and clearly written, it shows how to call the basic routines from your own BASIC or machine language programs. But it's not simply a how-to. The toolkit is also an extensive reference guide to your machine's operating language. The basic routines can be powerful, versatile programming tools. This book shows how to build a complete programming kit with these ready-to-use routines. If you already know machine language, you'll soon be picking the routines you need, avoiding basics interpretation of each statement, and creating machine language programs that do the same things as basic, and much more, but that execute far faster. If you're programming in BASIC, you'll see how to call its ROM routines from within your own programs to make them even more powerful. What's more, by studying the explanations of the BASIC ROM routines, you'll even begin to understand the techniques used to create BASIC itself. A few of the other things included are how to modify BASIC, techniques which pass values between BASIC and machine language, detailed discussions of BASIC sys and user, clear step-by-step -step explanations of the basic ROM routines. Okay, let's take a look inside. It's very shiny. I still haven't totally figured out my lighting here. Okay, I find it useful to look over the table of contents in these books. So this book is essentially just two parts. Part one is overview and applications 
showing how to use sys and usr or user direct use of floating point routines very interesting modifying basic and mixing basic and machine language so the first 80 something pages are these kind of like tutorials and explanations and then part two is a detailed description going through the basic rom routines he's grouped everything together and so we have basic initialization entry phase character get character got tokenization and program storage memory allocation and moves pointer resets expression evaluation variables and arrays floating point operations string operations statement execution and program flow and then detailed breakdowns of some of the major statements in basic print list define and function function invocation input get read input output routines comparison of operands peak poke and wait position random sys and user and then some routines that get used often check for ascii a to z in accumulator check if in direct mode get expression at next text pointer location issue in line number message syntax check for parentheses comma or ascii character in accumulator error messages in ready polynomial computation sine cosine and tangent and a few more mathematical functions there the appendices and the index and the preferences worth looking at i think it's worth me just reading through it for you because it states the purpose of this book and all the information so well uh, i mean otherwise i could just try and summarize it myself but he, in my opinion he doesn't waste any words <laughs> i really like his writing style so i'm just going to go ahead and read through it before starting on this book i saw basic is just a black box into which you put something and out popped the result exactly what went on inside that little box was unknown now after finishing the book not only is it obvious what's going on inside basic but it's also easy to use the same routines that already exist in basic in your machine language programs in the sense that the basic routines are tools this book tells how to build a toolkit from basic one group of basic tools that can be used are the floating point math routines an entire section is devoted to how to use these other tools from basic such as moving a block of memory may be found by examining the various detailed descriptions of routines by picking only the routines that you need from basic and avoiding the interpretation of each statement you can create a machine language program to do the same thing as a basic program but much more quickly it's an interesting idea using basic as a toolkit for your own machine language programs of course many people have done this but this book appears to be the most in-depth guide to that that i've ever known in reading other people's programs i prefer to find a nicely formatted listing that is conducive to easy reading it seems that many listings of basic programs try to cram as many statements as possible into one line without any spaces or remarks sure it saves space but avoiding eye strain is my preference <laughs> well i'm guilty many programmers especially those who use languages other than basic prefer the more structured approach to programming i include myself in this group finally i prefer the way you can trace what is happening in a program to a much finer detail in machine language with basic you have to assume that the definitions of the language are correct and if they aren't it's impossible to know whether your program or the language itself is in error for an example of how blind faith in a high-level language can lead you astray enter and run the following short program on a commodore 64 or vic 20 line 10 a equals go parenthesis quote x quote comma five and closing parenthesis this statement should produce a syntax error since there's no go function in microsoft basic yep no syntax error is produced however instead either a warm start of basic is done similar to pressing the stop and restore keys at the same time or you hang the system <laughs> so give that a try when you read the section on function invocation you will see what happens with this statement this example points out that the rules basic supposedly lives by 
don't always hold true. So I, I found this part really interesting. Why this book? After the comments about BASIC, you may be wondering what I am doing writing a book about how BASIC works. Well, when I approached BASIC as just a large machine language program, I found it very interesting. Also, I have come to appreciate the immediate feedback from BASIC, and I recognize that BASIC is widely used and very easy to learn. This book is to be accompanied by a book explaining the inner workings of the kernel. The Commodore 64 and the VIC-20 are small enough that one person is able to understand all the major aspects of the built-in software. And this is one of the reasons why I find the C64 so interesting, is because this is true. One person can understand them all with, <laughs> although for some of us who are a bit slow, it takes years of study. One of the more pleasant moments while doing the research for this book came when seemingly unrelated topics suddenly fell together to make sense and give the aha feeling. An example of this is when I was looking at function invocation for user and realized there's no reason why user could not operate on string functions. That's actually news to me, because everything I've ever read says that user does not work on string functions. A plethora of introductory books already exist about the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. Once you get through these introductory books, where do you go? Besides magazine articles, there are few intermediate or advanced texts. I hope this book will find its niche in this uncrowded category, and that's completely true. Okay, and finally, I'll start summarizing. He says that the book assumes that you're already familiar with basic and 6502 machine language. This is not a text to introduce you to that. It's also interesting that he does not share any of the source code for Microsoft Basic or in the next book for the kernel due to copyright concerns, but encourages you to disassemble it yourself or get another disassembly. And nowadays there's lots online. And the book also covers both the C64 and the VIC-20, and he describes the notation he uses. So for example, if he writes E034 slash E023, that means that E034 is for the C64, and E023 is the address on the VIC-20. But if he puts a slash, like B slash D02B, that means on the C64, that address is B02B, and on the VIC-20, it's D02B. And that's because the first 8K of BASIC on the VIC-20 and the C64 are identical, except that they start at different addresses. And all the differences between the two BASICs are actually in the kernel ROM, the 8K kernel ROM, which has about another 1K of actual BASIC code in it before the kernel ROM actually starts. So and just to flip through the rest of the book here, so we can move on to the next book. Part one, overview and applications. And he gives a very interesting description of how basic works at, you know, a simplified version, but still useful. Describes the sys and user functions. He's made a bunch of examples of how to use the sys command and the USR function. So he lays out his code, both the basic and the assembly side of it. And the third example for sys actually includes adding extra parameters onto the end of a sys command, like I showed not that long ago. Uh, I guess it's from Lodestar that I learned this. Well, this goes all the way back to, did I mention what year this, yes, this, this book is from 1984. So this technique was described in a book from 1984. And the examples for USR, which includes how to use strings from USR. So that's very interesting because the uh, C64 Programs Reference Guide, I think, explicitly states that you know, it only works with numeric variables. Okay, and the next section is direct use of floating point routines. And he describes how the floating point routines work. 
and then all the different functions that are available. And most importantly, like some of this is covered in mapping the C64 and other books, but this is the only one I'm aware of that where examples are given, floating point example number one, converting the accumulator and X register to an ASCII string and send to current output device. And he's got like three example here, example 18, 19, compare two numbers and display. So that's pretty incredible and goes along with that toolkit idea of Commodore Basic having all these useful routines in them that can be used from machine language. You don't have to rewrite all those routines. You can make use of them for your machine language routines and gain a lot of speed without all that much work. Okay, the next section, modifying Basic and talks about how to add extra commands. And again, so he's got examples of adding new basic commands, different techniques to do this for both the C64 and the VIC-20. And then a short chapter on mixing basic and machine language, basically some tips on how to combine that. I think we covered some ideas about that in a previous episode here, but more information is always good. And then part two, detailed descriptions. <laughs> and this book is, you know, 400, what is it? 421 pages, including the index. So the detailed part starts at page 89 and goes for to about page 400. So over 300 pages of detailed description. And we're just gonna flip through. So basic initialization, entry phase. So again, this isn't a disassembly of basic, but it is a walkthrough with addresses. So for example, this routine that displays the ready prompt on the C64, it's at A474, and on the VIC-20, it's at C474. And it tells a bunch of places where it's called by, the operation, the main basic loop. Character get, tokenization, table of basic keywords, expression evaluation. This is very detailed. Variables and arrays. Very big section on how variables are handled. Floating point operations. That's a very big section as well. String operations, statement execution, and program flow, like go sub, return, run. That's a big section as well, all about how print works. Listing, defining functions. Input, get, and read. The input output routines. Peak, poke, and wait. Sys and user. And then these uh, kind of, let's call them utilities. Error messages, polynomial computation, and then math functions, like sine and cosine. <laughs> like the sine function has 23 steps to it. Okay. 
and exponents log and then the appendices these actually look just like the ones in mapping the c64 which is also by compute there are the ascii codes that's interesting the vic20 does not use petsky codes 149 to 155 Oh, which are a bunch of these colors here. Those are like the extended C64 colors. Screen codes. Screen location table. Key codes. Oh, I didn't realize that the key codes for the C64 and the VIC-20 are different, like A returns a key code of 10 on the 64 and 17 on the VIC. Uh, location 653. Same location number and zero page though to read to see the key code. Value store at location 653. Oh, <laughs> why is code two listed twice for Commodore? What is on both sides? <laughs> I guess that's just like a typo misprint and then a full index okay that's it for the basic book i know i totally skimmed over that but i am amazed at how much information is in that book all right let's look at the kernel Computing with the kernel. When you turn on your Commodore 64 or VIC computer and the screen displays the familiar bytes free message, you're seeing the kernel is at work. Yeah, again, this lowercase kernel is interesting, but they still did preserve the kernel spelling with an A instead of a regular E. In fact, you probably seldom use the VIC or 64 without accessing the kernel. The kernel routines, named for a misspelled version of the word kernel, there you go with an E, meaning essence or core, make up the operating system of the Commodore home computers. Compute's VIC-20 and Commodore 64 toolkit, the kernel, is your guide to the heart of your computer. Thoroughly documented and clearly written, it describes the mysterious inner workings of the kernel read-only memory ROM. Learning about the kernel is important to anyone wanting to fully understand Commodore computers. Understanding the kernel is particularly important if you're programming machine language routines, either for use with basic programs or as standalone programs. If you already know machine language, Toolkit the Kernel can help you determine the best place to jump into the ROM routines to keep your programs as short as possible. It will also help you trap the bugs in programs you've already written by allowing you to follow the process step by step. The kernel descriptions in this book include system reset, initializing the computer, IRQ interrupts, using IRQ interrupts in your program, NMI interrupts, understanding hardware interrupts, the kernel jump table, wedging into the kernel, screen routines, displaying information on the screen, serial input output, sending and receiving serial information, RS-232 input, and yeah, serial is for the serial disk drives, and for the printer as well. RS-232 input-output, handling RS-232 communications, tape input and output, writing to and reading from cassette tape. Computes VIC-20 and Commerce 64 Toolkit, the kernel is a significant resource for all programmers. If you want to understand and use the machine language routines already in your computer, this reference guide will be a vital part of your programming library. Okay. So the table of contents, again, a forward and a preface, and then chapter one through 10. That's basically what we just read on the back cover. So I won't read those again, but you can see this is more typically split up into 10 chapters than that previous book. That was really two huge sections. And again, appendices, index of kernel routines by address, cross-reference of kernel routines by chapter. So the foreword, I won't read all this, but it does say it's a sequel to the Toolkit Basic book. 
and is an excellent companion to other compute books like Mapping the VIC, Mapping the C64, Programming the VIC, Programming the Commodore 64. Armed with these guides and a ROM listing, you'll discover all the secrets of your VIC or 64. Oh yeah, and this, this is also by Dan Hebe, and this is copyright 1985, so he took another year to write this book, give or take. Preface. The subject of this book is the part of the Commerce 64 and VIC-20 called the kernel. Some people think of the kernel as only the standard jump vector table, which is correctly called the kernel jump table. But the kernel is actually larger, it is the section of ROM that handles the input, output, and system management routines, such as the interrupt handlers. The remaining part of ROM that makes up the basic language is covered in the Toolkit Basic book. The 6502 chip is the microprocessor in the VIC-20, while the Commerce 64 has the 6510. Both chips use the same machine language instruction set. While it is not absolutely essential that you know 6510-6502 machine language to read this book, it would help. Numerous books on the machine language are available, so this book does not attempt to teach machine language programming, and like in the basic one, Due to copyright restrictions, a commented disassembly of the code for the kernel is not presented in this book. Using any machine language monitor, you should be able to view the disassembled kernel on your screen and follow along with the comments of the code that are found here. So again, rather than it being a disassembly, this is like a commentary. At least two books are available that contain printed listings of the kernel instructions if you find it easier to read rather than view them on the screen. These are Anatomy of the Commerce 64 from Abacus Software and Inside the Commerce 64 by Milton Bathurst. Interesting that Compute would recommend non-compute books. That's good of them. The main purpose of the kernel is to allow communication with the various I.O. devices, the screen, keyboard, and cassette drive, as well as RS-232C devices, disk drives, and printers. The interrupt routines are crucial in the functioning of I.O. handling, as interrupts allow an I.O. device to notify the processor that needs servicing. The information in this book applies to both the Commerce 64 and the VIC-20. And again, like before, when an address differs, the addresses are specified with a slash between the two numbers. So that's the same as what he used in the basic. Also, timer A is on the Commerce 64, and that means timer 1 on the VIC-20. And again, it's best used in conjunction with mapping this VIC or mapping the Commerce 64. And then let's we'll take a quick look through the chapters. Chapter 1, Interrupt and System Reset. So describing the interrupts, and I, I suppose System Reset is like, is an interrupt as well. It's certainly a signal line on the processor. So well, it seems like a very detailed description of interrupts. Chapter 2, System Reset. The reset routine in the 64 and VIC, which is activated when the power is turned on. And here's the reset routine. And it goes through step by step what is done. Disable the IRQ interrupts. Initialize the stack pointer to FF. Clear the decimal flag in the status register. Jump to the subroutine to check for auto start cartridge. Okay, and then it jumps to the auto start if there is one. And then the following steps 7 to 13 apply only to the 64. So then it does some VIC initialization, CIA initialization, memory pointers, kernel RAM vectors, VIC2 registers. Uh, set the PAL NTSC flag, enable IRQ interrupts, and then jump to basics cold start routine. Oh, and then here's the equivalent on the VIC-20, which has slightly fewer steps. Test for auto start cartridge. So all the things your C64 or VIC-20 do every time they're powered on or reset. Initializing round vectors. Okay, again, this video is going to be forever if I look at it. I think you're getting the idea. Lots of good information here. Chapter 3 is about NMI interrupts and the differences. So on the 64, when you hit the restore key, it actually causes an NMI. But also the flag line, timer A or timer B, can all cause an NMI. And then the equivalents on the VIC. So 
So for the NMI interrupt handler, there are a total of 29 steps and he goes through each one of them, giving memory addresses where appropriate. And in some of these areas, the VIC-20 and C64 are so different that he's just written like, here's the NMI interrupt handler for start timer B for the C64 at these addresses, and then for the VIC-20 at different addresses. Chapter four is IRQ interrupts. And these are the ones that are produced. Yeah, normally IRQ interrupts are produced every 60th of a second by timer A of CIA number one on the 64, or timer one of VIA number two on the VIC. And this is, this is the kernel interrupt routine that does things like scan the keyboard and so on. Flash the cursor. So. Again, detailed listing. Oh, here's even about reading the keyboard, the Commodore 64 keyboard matrix. Oh, and there's the VIC-20 matrix. Oh, and apparently they are quite different. I don't remember if I've ever read the VIC-20 keyboard directly using this technique. I certainly have on the 64. Chapter five kernel routines. So this is about the standard jump table here. And for example, FFD2 is the famous one that prints a character to the screen and that works on the PET, the VIC-20, Commodore 64. Uh, as far as I know, all the 8-bit Commodore computers, this part of the kernel is standardized between all of them, that jump table. So this appears to be a very detailed breakdown of these. This really is a great companion to mapping the C64 because when you read mapping, you think, oh, this is great. Look at all this information. It's like everything in the C64, but it's not actually detailed enough to make use of it in a program often. Uh, it'll mention, you know, this routine is here at this location, but it doesn't actually tell you enough that you could set up and use that, like if you call it, you can't just jump to that subroutine there's set up to do. And this book describes all that. For example, when you're setting the name for file name or set the file name location number of characters, it tells you right here what is stored and where. A, X, and Y, and the memory locations. For just one example. Chapter six, miscellaneous routines. Set IO defaults and home cursor, called by none. This routine is not called by any other kernel or basic routines. However, if you call it from a program, it calls a routine to reset the default input device to be the keyboard, the default output to be the screen, homes the cursor, and resets the screen line link tables. Well, that's handy. Display kernel message. See if a logical file exists. Extract logical file number, device number, and secondary address from tables. Display the loading verifying message. Display the saving file name message. Chapter seven, screen routines. Okay, the kernel screen editor routines are also used by BASIC to fill the BASIC input buffer. At 0200, the screen editor routines allow you to use the cursor control keys to move the cursor to any line on the screen and edit that line. That's saying that even though the VIC and C64 have different size screens, the screen editor routines for the two computers are the same. And then the differences in the routines are, and so it does have a few differences, but I guess the underlying code is the same. So the screen editor on the 64 and the VIC-20 really was well on the PAT. Really, especially on the PAT, was really ahead of its time. And I've mentioned this before, but uh, when I'm making my videos, I'm just whizzing around on the, on the screen, that cursor's ability to move anywhere is so helpful to me to use as a pointer. So, you know, I'm not like pointing at the screen with my finger or having in post-production always like put some arrow on the screen. With the Commodore machines, I'm almost always able to move the cursor around and show you what I'm talking about with the blinking cursor. And there's a lot of 8-bit computers of that era that just could not do that. 
you just had to type in uh, lying down at the bottom of the screen. So uh, that really is a great feature. And it's really cool to have all this all this information about how it works. All, all these variables, all zero page, like such as the cursor blink status, the character that's under the cursor, current character color, and so on. Initializing the video chip registers, getting characters from the screen. How many pages? This, this is a lot of pages about the screen routines. Decrement screen line pointer if the cursor moves left to a new line. <laughs> it really is quite complicated. It really makes me appreciate how much work went into that line editor and the way it has virtual lines. You know, you have a 40 character physical line, but it's actually an 80 character logical line or on the VIC-20, it's a 22 character physical line, but up to an 88, four physical lines can be combined for one logical line. Really impressive. Oh, it just goes on and on. Okay, there we go. Chapter eight, serial IO routines. So this is how the VIC and C64 talk to the intelligent devices like the 1541 disk drive or printers or, you know, really anything. CMD came out with all those devices after like hard drives and so on. And they just plug in and they work. They might be slow, but it's amazing how no software is required. You just plug the thing in and you can load and save from it. So that's pretty amazing. So it's talking about pretty low level here, what the serial commands are. This is something I'm going to read in great detail and maybe eventually I'll make an episode about this, but this, I mean, this subject alone is quite complicated. Yeah. Attention requests from the 64. It's got a diagram here of what happens when the 64 is calling or when the 64 is trying to get the attention of a disk drive. Wow. <laughs> This is great. I was, I didn't even know that this, uh, this information existed. I was actually looking for this quite a while ago when I was talking to the 8-bit guy, uh, back when he was starting the Commander 16 project, I was talking to him about trying to, uh, implement the serial IO. I had no, I had no idea this information was here. Okay. So that is another big chapter of serial IO, RS-232 IO used by modem routines, or some sometimes people use uh, RS-232 printers instead of serial printers. Well, instead of IEC serial printers, instead of Commodore serial printers. These are serial, or at least some of them are. So that's RS-232 and the tape IO routines. Okay, so about the cassette tape, and it goes into a lot of detail here. About the header. Oh yeah, the VIC-20 couldn't save above memory location 8000. It was Chuck Hutchins who told me about that. He was having trouble saving, I think, a cartridge to tape. And found out that this was a limitation on the VIC-20. So look, this whole problem is discussed here. <laughs> and I didn't even know about that until a year or two ago. Wow. Oh, all this information about tape. I could make so many episodes of 8-Bit Show and Tell just based on like each of these chapters could easily be a super deep episode. In fact, I'm not even sure if I really went deep, how many episodes would it really take to go through, for example, the tape IO? This is crazy. Oh, this goes on and on. Typical tape format. Wow. Actually, I've, I've heard that like the guy who led the 6502 team wrote the tape routines. I think that's right. And then nobody else could fully understand them. So they just kept sticking them in the later Commodore machines without really even understanding how they worked. <laughs> I'm not sure how true that is, but maybe they got them figured out. Can you imagine how long it took to write this book? You know, that's incredible. 
So much detail here. <laughs> Tape I like it's how big is this chapter? Oh so that started on page two hundred and seventy one. It goes to 398, 127 pages about the tape routines. That's incredible. First of all, it's amazing that they were written. You know, they started back on the pat and they kind of evolved through to here. And then that somebody was able to reverse engineer them. And, you know, that it takes 127 pages of commentary to describe what's going on. Amazing. Okay, and now we're in the appendices here. Commerce 64, VIC-20, I.O. and video control registers. Huh. I haven't seen these before. It's interesting that they're using this, this kind of font. Okay, index of kernel routines by address. So you can go through by an address and it tells you what it's doing and where to look up that information. So that's pretty great. If you're just trying to like disassemble or step through some code and you end up at some address, you can just look here and then find out where to get like a detailed commentary on it. And this makes an excellent like summary starting here at E505 of the kernel on the 64 and going all the way to FFF3. So basically anywhere in the kernel, you can look up and then find a commentary on it. And same for the VIC-20. And Appendix C, cross-reference of kernel routines by chapter. So it's going the other direction and go from a chapter in the book and find out what memory address is in the kernel that's a boat. Okay, and then here we're in the buy this stuff. Okay. Woo! So these books are amazing. Where have they been all my life? They obviously did not sell well because you know what? Even mapping the C64 wasn't all that well known in the 80s. I'm not saying it wasn't, but I mean I didn't get a, I didn't hear about it or get a copy until the 90s. And then Rato Colin West's book, Programming the Commerce 64, I didn't get a copy of that until, you know, well into the 2000s, I think, if I'm remembering right. And lots of people don't know about that book. But these, I only learned about them like two years ago. So thanks again to David Yaud, and maybe maybe somebody else mentioned them to me too, uh, for just making me aware of them. And thank you to this seller here in Canada who put them up on eBay and nobody went for them. <laughs> I actually saw them listed. There was more, and then they were relisted at a lower price. And then on, uh, I was watching it, and then he made an offer even uh, for a further discount, and I went for it. And I am happy. And then there's all those other books, too. I got to look through sometime. Okay. Well, again, you know, like, sometimes I, I'm just skimming through it super fast. But I encourage you to check these books out. If you can't find a physical copy, there's PDFs available online. It's an amazing time to be learning about this stuff because, you know, of all the information that's available. So check it out. Read it. Hey, thanks to my patrons for their support, uh, especially in making these patron-exclusive videos. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.